Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. We could do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, that's much better. Welcome to Ben Sale of United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you're welcome here. So I have some announcements for you this morning. Busy schedule. We're into Holy Week. So besides services this morning, on Maundy Thursday, we will be gathering at 7 p.m. over at St. John's for a Maundy Thursday service. On Good Friday, we will have a service at St. Peter's at 7 p.m. There are Easter dawn services scheduled at both Dinky and Zion Stone, who have been gathering with us during the uh, uh, Lenten midweek series. You're invited to attend those. You'll have to check their websites. I do not have the times for those services. Uh, and then uh, on Easter Sunday, we will have our services at our regular time, which would be 8 and at 10.15. Uh, beginning next week on Easter Sunday, the church board has decided to return to the passing of the offering plates and the, no uh, the, joyf noisy, yeah, the joyful noise offering. Whew, I'll get it out yet. All right. So when you walk in, you will not see the offering plate in the box out there in the narthex anymore. They will be coming around to collect your money. Well, I mean, uh, to take your offering. Um, so we will uh, be changing that just in a little bit of a, a, a new thing. Well, I shouldn't say a new thing. Something we're resurrecting. Ah, good word for that day, isn't it? Uh, going back to the old way that it was used to be done. Uh, currently, we're right now, we're looking for greeters for Sunday morning services for both the 8 a.m. and the 1015 service. If you're interested in volunteering to serve as a greeter, uh, please let Sharon Elder, Sharon, Sharon's out in the narthex there. She has a purple jacket on. She's waving right now, but she, you got to come up here to wave so they can see you. But um, just ask for Sharon if you're interested. And there is a uh, calendar out there uh, listing the openings uh, that are available. Uh, you saw there was an announcement, and it's in your bulletin, that there's a card shower for June Locke. She's turning 99 years old on April the 8th. God bless her. And I guess he really has. So if you would like to, uh, you know, send her a card, please do so. Uh, if you're not in the card sending uh, type of mood or that's not your thing, just remember her in your prayers, please, and give, uh, give thanks for the life that God has given her. On April 20th, we will be having a ham and dandelion dinner here at Ben Salem. It's from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. I'm told it's served family style, all you can eat. Um, the uh, tickets are $15 for adults, it's $7 for children ages 5 to 10, and if you're under 5, you get to eat for free. Good, good family deal. Um, dessert and beverages included for those prices, so come out and enjoy uh, join us and uh, enjoy the meal. I uh, also want to thank everyone who was uh, in any way, shape, or form responsible for helping to make our Spring Bazaar a success. Uh, don't have figures yet, but uh, they will be coming, I'm sure, shortly. And also, as you're leaving this morning, 
uh, to the rear and to the left out in the narthex, there is still a little bit of Easter candy left over. So if you have purchased yours and you've already eaten it, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, all right? Um, and I'm not going to tell you whether I have or have not. You can draw your own conclusions. Um, but there is a little bit of Easter candy out there. That candy is homemade here at church, so help yourself to that out there. Um, and Dawn, you're on. She's the lady in the uniform with toothpicks holding her eyelids open. I'm not sure how she does all she does. Good morning. Good morning. I would... I would like to invite you all out to our egg hunt following this uh, service. We're going to be starting at 1130. It is for all ages and all capabilities. Uh, we will be having an indoor egg hunt for anybody who does not feel comfortable going outside and walking on the grass. Um, that also qualifies for anybody using a walker or canes or anything like that. We'll make sure that you are able to participate. Um, there's plenty of prizes. We have over 350, uh, 350 eggs and about 150 prizes. So, please come out, because if not, we're going to need shopping carts for those who do come. So, come on out and have a good time with us. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Are there any announcements from the congregation this morning? All right. If not, then I'm going to ask all that is, those that are able to please rise. Please join me in the call to worship. In the name of the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed is the coming, uh, coming kingdom. Hosanna, Hosanna in the, in the highest. highest. When Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. <clears throat> Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna in, in the highest. highest. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who sent ahead and who, those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out at, to Bethany with the twelve. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna, Hosanna in, the in the highest. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. God of salvation, Lord, and through his passion to raise us to life in his holiest week, help us to walk the way of the cross, that we may be risen in resurrection like his, and dwell forever in you, eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.
let us now confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Please join me in the prayer. We confess that we have sinned, and although we would like to deny it, we have forsaken you. We are horrified by the suffering we cause to you, ourselves, and the world you have created. Open the gates of your forgiveness and restore us in your love. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, the Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of a doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, forgiven and free. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace of Christ now with one another. Please be seated. A crown of thorns placed on his head, he knew that he would soon be dead. He said, did you forget me, Father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross. Soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ the King before his Let's go. 
first lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament portion of our Bibles. It's the 118th Psalm, verses 1 through 2, and then skipping down to verse 19 through 29. Hear now the words of the psalmist. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of St. John, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had to be done to him. Here ends this day's lessons. God blesses us with the hearing of his words once again. May he also enable us to understand what those words written so many thousands of years ago mean for us as we live out our lives in this time and this place here today. Amen. All right, kids, it's time for some conversation with the pastor. Save me a seat, please. <laughs> Can 
you get up there, hon? Don't, don't fall. Okay. You're squished? Okay, I'm sorry. Am I taking up too much room? Mm hmm You need a smaller pastor, huh? Yeah. Well, honey, that ain't happening. I'm just saying. As much as I might like to, it's not going to happen. All right. So, does anybody know what today is called? The official name. Yeah, it's Sunday, yep. Yeah? Palm Sunday, okay? And you know what? What are these things here? Do you see this, like, tree here? What is this? Do you know what this is? It's a palm branch. That's right. It's a palm branch, yeah. And after church, you guys are going to go out and they're going to give you some palm branches. And also, they have some old palm branches that have been folded into the shape of a cross, okay? So make sure you get one of those to take home as a souvenir today. Oh, okay. Before it falls on somebody's head, all right? Very good. So I'm going to read a story to you, all right? See? Who's this guy here on the donkey? Jesus, right. Yep. And what are they doing here? Yeah, they're laying palm branches down. And what is this guy doing? He's what? Well, waving, and he looks like he's kind of cheering, right? Yeah, he's happy to see Jesus coming. All right, so let's read the story and see what it says. The city of Jerusalem was packed with people. Come, well, you can't see, I'm sorry. The city of Jerusalem was packed with people. Come to celebrate the Passover festival. It was also time for Jesus to start the last stage of his life on earth. Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a humble donkey. His followers threw their cloaks, the cloaks that were their coats, okay, another name for coats, or large palm leaves on the dusty ground before him. And he was met by an enormous crowd, for many had heard of the miracles he had performed. The religious leaders might fear and hate Jesus, but many of the people truly saw him as their king, and they tried to give him a king's welcome calling out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus was sad, for he knew that soon these people cheering would turn against him. They expected him to fight with them against the Romans, and that was not what he was on earth to do. Okay? So the people were cheering for Jesus when they thought he was coming in to do what they wanted him to do, but when they found out he wasn't going to do it their way, they weren't so happy with him, right? Oh, that's okay. You came back. That's what counts. All right. What, honey? Oh, are we doing it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. As soon as church is over, okay? All right. Yep, we're going to do an Easter egg hunt. All right, so let, how about we pray before I lose more control? <laughs> you know, it's good to know that we have the important things on mind, the Easter egg hunt, right? All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came to save us from our bad behavior. Lord God, help us to always cheer for Jesus and not turn away or forget him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, thank you. Careful.
One thing we know for sure, Ben Salem is definitely positively blessed musically. Thank you so much. Now, normally on a Palm Sunday, I would be talking to you something about uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the fact that he was riding on a donkey, uh, you know, there's a whole host of things I could have been talking to you about, but there was something else that caught my eye. And it was one single solitary word that was located in the psalm. And that was the word cornerstone. And I started thinking about that cornerstone. So as I usually do, I want to make sure that I understand it correctly and not just rely on my own personal uh, definition. I, I consulted a couple of dictionaries, and here's what I found. Cornerstone, a noun. A stone forming a part of a corner or angle in a wall. Now, you have an illustration up there. Yes, today it even comes with pictures, I tell you. But don't expect it all the time because, like I told you, my IT is not my thing. But if you notice that large stone in the front there, that stone is sitting on the bottom, and the other stones are all either butting up against it or lying on top of it and spreading out from there. It goes on to say that it's a stone that forms the base of a corner of a building joining two walls. And that's exactly what we see in this illustration here one cornerstone and the walls are going out in either direction from there. But it was this last uh, definition that I found that I really liked the most. It says cornerstone or foundation stone or setting stone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone thus determining the position of the entire structure. Now, that elevates the cornerstone to a whole different level because, for instance, if you want the building facing a certain direction and you don't set that first stone down correctly, your building's going to be cockeyed one way or the other and it will be there for eternity because once the walls are put in place, there will be no adjusting it. It dictates how everything else follows through and flows through. Now, when I was, when I was a little boy, actually, my, uh, my uncle did two building uh, additions to his home. And so we're, we were uh, kind of cut of the same cloth like you folks up here. We tried to do as much ourselves as we possibly could. So got a backhoe in, dug out the footer, came, poured the base, cement, everything leveled off, and then we started to lay the cement blocks ourselves. Now, I don't exactly remember. There's a couple of ways that you can do this. I don't exactly remember what method my dad and my uncle used. There's a way that you can do it with string, and there's a way that you can simply do it with a builder's square. But we started in one corner, and we started laying the base blocks, all right? My job as a, as a child was to help mix the mortar, and I mudded the blocks. Now, is there anybody that does not know what it means to mud a block? There's no shame in that. Does everybody know? Or, or does everybody know? Okay. Okay. So when you're the mudder, what you do is you take a trowel, and you work the mortar out, and you get it to a certain thickness. And then you cut slits in it, almost like you'd be cutting a pizza, only you're cutting long strips. 
and you take that and you lay it on the cement foundation in the order, in the direction that the blocks are going to lay. And then the blocks have those little webs in between. So you cut smaller pieces and lay it between those two parallels that are running the length of the wall. What you do is you take your block, you set your block down in that mud, you take a wooden block and a hammer, and you tap it down to cement it in place. So literally the cement becomes a binder that holds the block fast to the cement foundation. All right, so it's very critical. You start at one corner, and you lay that corner, and you make sure it's square. Then the next thing I remember them doing is attaching a string to the, to the one side of the wall that we had just started the corner on and ran it down to the far end. You yet, then use that string as the guide to make sure that your wall remained straight until you got down to the other end where you would then again take off from the wall that you had built this way and start building this one to make sure that it was square, okay? Now, if this works, if this works, if this works, oh, come on. It worked this morning. Now I've got a pointer on. All right. Give me a second here. Well, I guess it's just not going to work. Not my day. All right. So you'll have to use your imaginations. On that picture was a right triangle. It had three legs, one vertical, lettered A, a horizontal, lettered B, and then the diagonal, letter C. All right? And in the very corner, at the bottom, it had a square. Now, there's something called the Pythagorean theory. And that says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what that says is that if you take the length of a and multiply it by itself, and the length of b and multiply it by itself, it will equal c multiplied by itself. So as an example, this is this is and does get used in building trades, and it works very, very well. So if you think of it this way, the shorter leg was A. So let's say that that A is 3. And let's say the base leg, B, is 4, a value of 4, and C would then have a value of 5. All right, so 3 times 3 is 9, okay? 4 times 4 is 16. 9 and 16 equals? 25. Thank you, 25. 5 times 5 equals? 25. 25. So if you've got a piece of string, 3 foot and 4 foot, and you nail them in a corner, and you extend them in two different directions, and you measure from this tip to this tip, if it measures 5, guess what? You've got a perfectly square corner. And it works great when you're building buildings and doing a whole lot of other things. But what happens when our measurements are off just a little bit? Well, consider this. If you're going somewhere and you're off course by simply one degree, after one foot, after traveling 12 inches, you will be off a quarter of an inch. Big deal, a quarter of an inch, right? What does that matter? Well, here's where it starts to matter. After you go about 100 yards, you're going to be off by 5.2 feet. 
It means your dimension. If you're supposed to be heading in this direction and you're off by one degree, you're going to be five feet, three inches off from where you're supposed to be. Doesn't sound like a big deal? How about when you go to buy a piece of property and they're surveying it? If your surveyor is off on his angle by one degree, you just lost five and a third feet widthwise at the 100 yards, plus that whole area in between there. You just lost that land, or somebody else did and you gained it. It reminds me, years ago, when my wife and I first got together, she lived in uh, Northampton, uh, outskirts. Anyway, they had uh, sidewalks. So you had your lawn, the sidewalk, and, and then they had this little grass berm, and then the curb. And quite honestly, it was just a pain. It was just wide enough that you couldn't cut it all in one pass with a lawnmower. So you had to make two passes, and then you always wound up with grass on the sidewalk, so you had to go out and sweep the walks and everything else. So we talked about it, and I said, look, this is real simple. We'll go out, we'll take all the sod off, and we'll put a uh, landscaping cloth down, and we'll put some kind of decorative stone, and then we won't have to worry about mowing in there anymore. And she said, fine. So now, this is in town, so everybody's got these real small lawns. So I started taking up the, uh, uh, the sod, and as I'm getting closer and closer, I'm being mindful of where the property line is, the neighbor comes flying out and says, whoa, make sure you know where the property line is. I said, I'm watching for it. He says, I'll show you where the marker is. He had driven spikes big nails in the ground to mark the boundary. See, I grew up, we had five and a half acres at home, all right? Our, our boundary was a line fence. Nobody knew where the pins were. We never even cared about it. If a tree went down on our side, we cut it up and stacked it in the line fence. If a tree went down on the neighbor's side, they cut it up, stacked it in the line fence, and whoever needed wood just helped themselves. We didn't worry about it. This guy had it right down to the exact line. I guess it has to do with how much you have, and if maybe the less you have, the more particular you are, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, that's where it becomes, the relevance becomes really important. So after a mile, if you travel a mile and you're off by one degree, you're going to be off 92.2 feet. That doesn't sound like a whole lot. But if you're traveling around the globe from Washington, D.C., you would miss by 435 miles and end up in Boston. In other words, if you took off from Washington, D.C. and wanted to go around the globe and come back to Washington, D.C., if you missed by one degree, you would be off 435 miles. A rocket ship going to the moon? If you were off, now think about all the ships we've sent up there, right? All the calculations that had to go into this. If those scientists would have been off by one degree, they would have missed the moon by 4,169 miles. That's twice the diameter of the moon. Or, traveling to the nearest star, you'd be off course by over 441 billion miles, 120 times the distance from Earth to Pluto, or 4,745 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. Now, those numbers get a little crazy, so I'm going to simplify it. Ken, you can verify this for me, I hope. All right, because I this, this reference was to aviation. They said in aviation there is a rule called the 1 in 60 rule. If you're off one degree traveling 60 miles, you will be one mile off from your des destination. Did you ever hear that? No. Okay. Well, I'm hoping. It's on the internet. It had to be true. No. <laughs> Irregardless, it doesn't matter. All right. And you're probably thinking, what does all this have to do? Well, Mr. Saul, my geometry teacher when I was in high school, would probably be very proud that I even remembered the Pythagorean theory or how to solve it, or maybe even more importantly, how I might possibly be able to use it. But it has nothing to do about that. What it has to do is it's another law of nature, of whatever you want to call it, of science, but it's a law that God created, just like the law of gravity, all mathematics, all of those 
calculations and figures and the things that we can do are all part of the design that God implemented when he created the world. So if you think about this, this cornerstone is really, really important. But for us as Christians, it has a whole different meaning. Going back to the 22nd verse in Psalms this morning, it says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That cornerstone was Jesus Christ. It's upon Jesus Christ that we build our faith. It's upon that rock that the church was built. Peter built on the foundation that Jesus Christ had laid. So here's the reality, folks. If Jesus Christ is the foundation and he is the cornerstone, and if we followed his pathways, we would be, we would be walking in a straight line. Unfortunately, we have this tendency to deviate, don't we? And I don't have to have you think too awful hard about where we are in this world today. Things are so far off the path that God has called us to live. People have drifted so far from the teachings of Jesus Christ who came to tell us what God's word was when he lived and dwelt among us here on earth. Because we've chosen to go our own way. We've decided that we know what's best. But you can see that one little deviation, as it progresses and progresses and progresses, gets wider and wider and wider. And soon we find ourselves so far removed from the will of God that we probably can't even get back on our own. But that's the message of the cross, folks. God saw how far we had strayed. God saw how lost we were. God saw how helpless and hopeless we were. And so he sent his son who ultimately gave his life on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven, but also so that we would have a guidepost by which to live our lives, to keep ourselves on that straight and narrow path. How many of us started out living our lives in one direction and then things happened and we turned and found ourselves heading off in our own direction? I won't ask for a show of hands, but I can tell you I know I have. It was only by the grace of God that I was able to discover what I was doing and where I was headed and to change course. And it's not something that we do once and done. You know, it's like driving a car. You know, you, you can't just hold on to the steering wheel and go. You have to sometimes correct the wheel. And so it is as we live out our lives in this world. We have to be making correction. So we need to know where exactly our destination is so that we can keep correcting and bringing ourselves back into the pathway that God has ordained for each of our lives. And no doubt about it, each of us has a different path that we have to travel. Each of us has had a different detour that we have run into. Each of us has had different trials and different tribulations that have pulled at us and caused us to look away and to lose our focus. A couple weeks ago, you remember, we talked about the folks, the Israelites were traveling through the desert and they were grumbling about food and water again. And they stumbled into an area that was infested with poisonous snakes. And when they came to their senses, they spoke to Moses. Moses spoke to God, and God said, Make a serpent out of bronze 
put it on a pole, and lift it up so that anyone who is bitten can look on it and be healed. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was nailed to a pole, and he was lifted up high for all of us to see. And that cross has become our guidepost. So whenever we find ourselves straying, whenever we find ourselves lost, all we need to do is look at the cross and remember the gift of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so folks, as we're ending our journey through Lent, that time of self-reflection, and we begin to enter into Holy Week, ask yourself the question, are you going to be among the people that cheered him on today, but a few short days from now, will you be one of those same people yelling the words, crucify him? Or will you be standing firm in your faith irregardless of what this world, irregardless of what society tells us is right, will you stand firm in your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ and let that be your guiding indicator that will keep you on that straight and narrow. The peace of Christ be with you as you search your hearts and search your minds. Amen.
Friends, let us now prepare our hearts and minds to come before God in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you call your children to gather to celebrate you in worship and praise. And Lord, this day we do that again. Lord, we ask that you would help us to always be ready to lift your name in praise. That we would always be joyful about the lives that you have given us to live. Father, far too often the cares and the concerns and the joys and the values of this world compete for our attention and for our time and our talents and our treasures. And far too often we fail to put you first. Far too often we expend our energies and all the other blessings you have given us in other pursuits. And when it comes time to worship you, when it comes time to praise you, when it comes time to honor you with our gifts, we're left empty, empty of spirit, empty of energy, and our hands empty because we have expended our resources in other areas. Lord God, help us to begin to see more clearly. Help us to hear your word in a different way. Open our hearts that we might hear your word and put your word into practice in alignment with your son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, help us to always revere your son, Jesus, as the cornerstone of not just our faith, but also of our very lives. Father, continue to call us in service to you. Continue to find ways to use us and to help us to use the gifts that you have blessed us with to further your kingdom here on earth. And Lord, not just in our lives, but in the lives of everyone throughout the world. Lord God, we pray for a day when there would be peace for all. When everyone would have enough to eat. When everyone would have a place to call home. Where everyone would have clothing and the basic necessities of life. Lord God, help us to seek out ways that we could possibly make that happen and make it clear to us, for sometimes, Lord, we don't even know where to begin. Father, this day we lift up those on our prayer list and those that we now name silently in our hearts and in our minds. Loving God, whether their battles be with the body or of the mind or of the spirit, we ask that you would send your help. Fill them with the Holy Spirit, that they might be able to remember and recall the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the words that he spoke while he was here with us on earth. Help to draw them nearer to you so that they may truly be able to experience your peace, not a peace that we can even begin to imagine, but a peace that passes all understanding and human wisdom. Lord God, we pray for their healing. Lord, help us to be able to accept the healing in whatever form that it comes. For sometimes our will is not yours. Father, we lift these things to you now as always. 
in and through the precious and blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our Sovereign, who taught us to pray to you using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, Jesus gave himself for the life of the world with humble hearts bowed in awe. Let us now offer ourselves and our gifts to God. This morning's tithes and offerings will now be brought forward. Please join me now in our prayer of dedication as printed in your bulletins. Holy God, we give thanks for your saving love made known to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Bless these gifts that they may bring life on earth as in heaven. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Go forth in peace to love and serve the world. And now may the blessing of God, who surmounts evil, bears our pain, and lives in us forever, fill you with a zeal for justice and passion for peace, this day and always. Amen. Thank you. 